Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground is a new weekly series that highlights northern and central Minnesota culture. Each week, we'll explore the unique people, places, and events that are an important part of our region. Each week, Common Ground videographers, editors, and myself will take viewers on a journey of exploration into the worlds of art, history, and culture. This week, we'll introduce you to Gordon Van Wert, a Native American stone sculptor from Park Rapids who tells us how art saved his life. Monica Hansmeyer of Turtle River shows us the intricate designs and jewelry making by using stones, gems, and metals for her work. And Roger Falgren of Aiken shows us how his rock collection became an art form. My name is Gordon Van Wert. I was uh, born and raised in Red Bee, Minnesota, which is on the Red Lake Indian Reservation. I was born in 1952. I grew up, spent all my, my boyhood there, and when I was about 14 years old, I got in trouble, and I ended up uh, getting sent away to a boarding school in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which turned out to be a life-changing experience for me. It was like, best thing that ever happened to me was getting caught. My teacher showed me a whole lot of really good design This is uh, the stone is, is uh, alabaster from Utah. It's a real pretty uh, red stripe and stuff. But the sculpture itself, <clears throat> this is a little hawk, and it's a red tail hawk because of the red stone. And this would be the red, he's thinking of the hawk. A lot of my uh, classmates, some have passed away, but they were very famous artists that are collected all over the world. Uh, my teacher is also one of them. Um, some of the art teachers from the school were at the top of their uh, uh, their class and what they did, Native American art. And that was the only school ever done just to uh, nurture fine art in the Native American community, uh, Indian country across the whole North American continent. Like I say, even some Samoans came to school there, some of the natives from Samoa. So that part of it is kind of turned me almost international, I guess, being on that campus. So it was like really, really uh, stimulating all these different types of art. You know, these guys who were painting with these splashing canvas with color and then pretty soon they would turn into like an eagle or something. It was, it was, it was outrageous. Well, the school itself, it started in 1963. It was one of Lady Bird Johnson's pet projects. So we, our school was about 300 of us at this school in Santa Fe. It was a beautiful old campus uh, that used to be the Santa Fe Indian School, which had a farm and everything. And it was a self-sufficient school back in the 30s and 40s. And in the early 60s, when uh, they turned it into the Institute of American Indian Arts, uh, Lady Bird just loved it. So she would bring all these dignitaries to the school and we always had like these ambassadors from like Africa and Europe and all these different people coming to visit the studios and the classes. There was Indians from all over the country. We even had some Samoans that went there. There were natives from, uh, uh, from uh, Canada who uh, I never even knew some of these tribes existed you know, I knew there was other Indian tribes, but growing up in northern Minnesota, you know about the Chippewa, the Sioux tribes. But once I got down there, I started meeting all these other Indians that I never knew existed. It was really uh, eye-opening. I went, there was Eskimos there. One of my best friends was an Eskimo. It was still academic school for us when I was in high school there. We did some art, but we still had to handle all of our required academics to graduate from high school. But after you graduated from high school there and you go into the college program, then you could concentrate just on art in, in a major way. So the first couple of years being in that boarding school really taught me a whole lot about camaraderie and uh, pride in what you do. My teacher just took me under his wing and helped me through the difficulty because my father left us when I was probably 10 years old and mom had seven of us to raise. I would live with different homes 
Not so much that I didn't like living at home, but was, I would get fed. There was food at other houses too, because there were seven of us trying to eat at the house. That's how I learned a lot about the culture of my reservation and my tribe was from living with these elders on the reservation. Uh, they loved it because I would go help them. And then I was a good listener. They loved to tell me their stories. And that's kind of where I got my storytelling. And I try to tell it in stone now. I'm doing a, a large six foot sculpture to the Arboretum down in Chaska. And it's all about the three sisters, which is a native story. And it's about uh, planting on one a pile or one plot, one little, is the corn, the beans, and the squash. The corn grows really tall and strong, and the beans have something to grow up on, to grow and climb on, and the squash with its big white leaves keeps the bottom covered to save the nutrients. And uh, a lot of native tribes have the story of the three sisters including the, uh, the Ojibwe. What I'm doing for uh, the Arboretum is the fourth sister, which in my story, the Chippewas have, the Ojibwe's have, it's the food that grows on the water. That's what brought us from New York in our migration to this part of the country, which is the wild rice. And wild rice is included in my story. So it's the story of the three sisters meeting the fourth sister which brought us in our migration to find the food that grows on the water, what we call monomen. History all over the world, if it wasn't for the artists, we sure wouldn't have much history to study because all historians study mostly is the art that's left, that these people made, all the way back to, to ancient, ancient times. So the artists are, in a lot of instances, are the storytellers of history. And that's what I feel really, particularly in stone, I really feel uh, honored to be able to do that. Passing that knowledge on is just, to me, is just continuing what the human race has been doing over and over and over and over all these thousands of years we've been on this planet. And no matter where you go in this world, there's always been another group that's gonna come and conquer the other group and try to destroy their civilization. But the art is always saved because even the conquerors would appreciate the art <laughs> they wouldn't destroy it all they would save some of it so that was how in fact they would study these other civilizations it's a lot of it is through art you know paleontologists those people god bless them too you know <laughs> i had a stroke five years ago a pretty massive stroke that left me paralyzed and uh, my whole left side was paralyzed i couldn't uh, sit up in bed it was pretty scary after my stroke, working on these larger sculptures, it actually became my physical therapy. So when, when even the vibrating air hammer I use would uh, stimulate the nerves in my hand. So it actually built more muscle back. And because this stroke thing, your muscles are always trying to atrophy. Uh, I, they lose their memory of, of how to work uh, because of the oxygen deprivation. So I have to, what they call, reroute all my electrons through my, uh, my brain to work my muscles again. I, I can pass this on. It's gonna keep, and it's gonna be around way past me and my children, my grandchildren. And there's no, there's no reason that I'll ever stop doing it. I became pretty successful in the Southwest. I, I've got stuff in museums in different parts of the world and major museums in this country. And I've shown in like Aspen and Vail and Palm Springs and you know, in museums and, but being accepted and being uh, appreciated again in my own homeland here, back in Minnesota, it makes a big difference to me. That's, it's like a whole different feeling. You know, my success down there was, was, was good and I felt good about it, but coming back home and being here and being accepted as, as an unaccomplished artist and treated as so, I. I think I earned it. <laughs> I love to use a lot of, of etched patterns and beautiful stones and simple design. I think what I'm going to start doing here today is make a bezel. And a bezel is the piece that it's going to wrap around the stone. And in this case, it's going to be fine silver like this, really 
bendable and, and it, this is called annealed which means that it's been heated, heat treated. So what I do is I'm making a home for this pretty stone and yeah this is the right millimeter height because it's just going to hit the edge of the stone, the top of the stone. So this metal is so soft I can just bend it around with my fingers and that's why I like to get it annealed before I work with it. And then I'll scribe a little mark so I know where to cut it. <clears throat> and then I'll use my pliers to clip it. So this is one of the most basic stone settings and it's really the one I prefer because I like all those beautiful stones. The name of my business is Seven Sister Design and I named it after my sisters. Um, I am the youngest of seven sisters, so I got lucky. I have a lot of sisters. Solder this joint together with this little mini torch, and it's oxygen and acetylene. That makes a nice flame. I'm going to clean it off. I got a little dirty. I'm going to pick up a little solder here. These are all my little solder chips that I cut, and this one is a hard solder, which means it's the highest temperature. Oh, I almost forgot my flux. This is a, a nice flux, and you need to put that on your metal before you solder, otherwise your solder won't flow. I was going to school up here in Bemidji, and I just wasn't quite the right fit at that point. I transferred to Stout because they had a good graphic design program. And I somehow signed up for a jewelry class, and I knew that was it. I had found it. Come over here to my shear and I'll cut some metal. So I think basically what I have here is like a, a mini fabrication shop. I think you'd probably find a lot of the same tools only in huge form at uh, a sheet metal place <laughs> because this is a metal shears. And I'm going to um, cut this metal right here to approximately what I want, but I'm not doing the design work yet. This is what people will recognize when they see my jewelry is a lot of different etched patterns in the metal. I'm going to do a little bit of um, hammer texturing here. I'm going to attach these now to this cool bale that I made. I'm going to ball up this silver on the end. that was that. And then I'm going to attach these two together. A little bale will hold it and I'll cut the other side. and then put it in my hand there and ball up this side and there. Then I'll pretty well be done with the fabrication part of this. So there. Now it's in the, the raw form and um, I'm going to put it in my hot pot over there and let it soak for a while and a lot of that tarnish is going to come off. Here it is after the ultrasonic cleaner, a little bit shinier. But now what I'm going to do is take all those brushes that I have and clean it up even more. I'm taking out the point where I soldered the 
seam together on that bezel. So I'm smoothing it out, getting rid of any unwanted marks, seeing what I got for texture, seeing what I have for texture. This is the dirty part of my job. The unromantic part of making my jewelry this yucky chemical. But it gives it that really nice deep black that I like. Now that pattern will show up so nice. There, and I think I'll do the texture here too. Stone looks like in there now again. Get that all finished. It looks nice. So now it's a reversible piece. Someone can wear it that way or this way, depending on the new thing. So I started out with four millimeter high bezel, and I probably went down to 3.75 millimeters high. Oh, the stone is cut so nice, so it's so easy to set. <laughs> there you go. Next thing I'll do is tumble it, and then I'll take it out of that tumbler and put it on a chain, and maybe I'll wear this one for a while. It's so pretty. And I make pendants and rings and bracelets and um, I also do some custom work too but mostly it's my designs. I started out working with agates and I had gotten this one saw and I was looking for a way to pay for more tools because I wanted a core drill to make marbles, you know, to, to uh, make it make easier for blank cutting for marbles. I've collected a lot of rocks. I started agate picking and such and I wanted to make jewelry and everyone was making jewelry and someone brought up an idea of making vases and out of stone. Had people requesting me to make lamps, so I started making lamps. People request all sorts of things, so I, I like to be happy with the design that I'm, or the design that I'm using. Sometimes it's just, it was, it was more about the challenge anyway, so. I have, usually have more than one project going at a time because depending how things are going on a given day, <laughs> what's working? If some days, you know, the cutting's going well, and that's, that's, that's nice, and some days it doesn't go well, so you do something else. <laughs> it's like the drilling, you know, Days drilling a go real well, and days it you'll fight it all the way, so you go do something else. That's why I have many projects working at a time. The process starts out rock selection. You look for shape and color. You look at how you want to cut it. Where would be a best spot to cut it? And look for cracks and flaws. You know, because don't like to finish something and have it break. I have. A rock set up in a saw here. We have a water and soluble oil mix in here. It has a 16 inch blade in it. And as the blade turns, it'll, it dips into the oil and brings it up, keeps, holds it onto the blade. And it cools and lubricates the blade while it's cutting through the rock. I would slice the rock, you know, slice the, so I get, so I can get a flat bottom on the rock. Yeah, and then I'll, I've got, uh, Oil dry here, and that will pull most of the oil out of them. Next step is drilling, so I'm putting on my apron to keep dry. This is a diamond bit, and it's a core drill, and it's the same type of drill you can use. They use to drill through concrete floors. Water's pumped in through here, and it goes down through the center of the, the bit. 
This usually takes about 30, 30 minutes plus, depending on the size of the bit, how deep you're going, how fast it'll cut. And there'll be days I like to sit up in my shop up here and just get pieces, set up pieces to do sandblasting. And, and I have a plotter, which is used to uh, cut, uh, I use to cut blasting mat, so it cuts parts. So if I want to cut out mooses at four inches or deer at four inches, I, I can set it up to cut out parts. And I work off images off a disc and mast. I've used everything from duct tape to uh, regular sandblasting mast. There's, I got some small details that have cut into it, so I'm removing, it's a process called weeding or just removing what I don't want. This is going to be, what do we want? This is a loon. It's telling me loon. Alrighty, we want it. Okay, this is this little room where I do my sandblasting. I got to tent it off and exhaust, and I can exhaust dust out the door window because it keeps a little little less dust in out in the other shop. These are pieces which I I've got masked on, removing everything but give some relief and it'll give a some contrast. Now I'll do that probably about four more times on that rock. When I'm done sandblasting I'll coat the rock with uh, clear lacquer and I'll pull the mast off. Clean some more of the glue off of it. You can see it's a moose with a couple of trees. So since I've broken it down into steps, you know, I've got uh, a pile of rock sitting behind the shop here that's got the bottoms all trimmed on them and they're ready to start drilling. And I have a few pieces set up in there already for it to be sandblasted. And some days I'm feeling really creative and, and, and I'll come up with, you know, something new or that because you see the rock and it tells you, it'll tell you what it wants. Went at this kind of backwards, you know, not knowing exact, not being, having a defined direction. And just, it, it just kind of letting it evolve on its own. So it, it's, it's always changing. I'm not, I may not be doing exactly what I'm doing two years from now, or as far as design, or, or maybe doing it a little differently, depending on the rock I have and, so that, that's, it's, that's it's an evolving process. <laughs>218-333-3020. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.